Our next speaker, Pete Nelson. He's a professor of medical oncology here at the University of Washington and an adjunct professor of pathology genome sciences. That means he's really smart. Uh, the Fred Hutch likes him, so that's good. He specializes in therapies for early and late stage prostate cancer, and his current research work involves efforts to understand the, prostate of, uh, the process of prostate carcinogenesis. Carcinogenesis means as cancer is turning into cancer. So the state from not having cancer to getting cancer, that process is called carcinogenesis. The aim of which is to develop diagnostic and prognostic and therapeutic strategy, strategies. Okay, so just let's back on up here. Diagnostic means I'm going to make a diagnosis of prostate cancer. Prognostic, do you guys know what that means? All right, some of you know and some of you aren't telling. <laughs> so prognostic means how are you going to do with that cancer? And so then the doctor says, I'm sorry, your prognosis is guarded. That's not good. Or your prognosis is excellent. That means don't bother to even come back to the clinic because you're all fixed up. All right, and therapeutic strategies. Therapeutic strategies is how do we pick what medicine or what treatment we're going to use for you. So there you go. You've got diagnosis, prognosis, and therapeutic strategies. But wait, there's more. All right. We have a group of overachievers here. Can you believe this? I mean, you put the GI doctors up here and it's, you know, we're playing cards with the dogs. But no, for prostate night, you can see here he is on top of Mount Rainier. And is that the sunset going down or the sunrise coming up? Yeah, it's the sunset because that's how long it took him to get there. All right, so he earned his doctorate at Kansas, and there was a biotechnology fellowship at NCI. Those are big people, and they do big stuff. And then he did a fellowship of medical oncology. Thank God he got to the University of Washington at last. And as you heard from Edith Ching, once you get here, nobody wants to leave. He's received many honors, including the Prostate Cancer Foundation Challenge Award, and he has pu published extensively. So without much ado... Let me bring you the next speaker. Oh, sorry. And no, no. Oh, <laughs> okay. Here he is, Pete Nelson. Thanks very much. So, um, in the following up from both uh, uh, the previous talks, my task is really to tell you about what happens in advanced prostate cancer once prostate cancer has left its site of origin. And we'll focus on three major areas. First, just really describing the features of advanced prostate cancer. We'll touch on the current treatments, and then I'll end up with some uh, from future directions of uh, where uh, the new technologies in genomic medicine are, are really heading with the idea of personalizing or providing a precision uh, treatment plan for, for patients. Um, so I'll get into some depth in each of these areas. First, again, focusing on the clinical behavior, I'll uh, describe the remarkable uh, uh, evidence of how prostate cancer is exquisitely sensitive to the androgen receptor and androgens such as testosterone. I'll touch on chemotherapy, a, a bit on immunotherapy, um, which has uh, one of its really central points located here in Seattle, and then touch again on the genomics and genetics and, and precision medicine. <clears throat> so, this is kind of a, a tongue-in-cheek slide that, again, is certainly relevant here in Seattle. Hopefully on that break you're uh, really charged up with plenty of, uh, of coffee out there. Um, but it is relevant to prostate cancer. So here is an interesting study that uh, simply looked at coffee consumption and both the incidence rates as well as the death rates related to prostate cancer, and interestingly, there was a significant uh, association. You may not be able to read it here, but uh, the good part is that coffee did reduce both the incidence rates and death rates, but you needed to drink about six cups a day to be able to uh, achieve that. So um, <clears throat> some of us do that routinely, maybe uh, others of you don't. So Dan, uh, Dan Lin touched on this a little bit. This is really what I'm going to focus on for the, the next uh, uh, 20 to 30 minutes, and that is 
um, the, death, uh, the deaths due to prostate cancer, which number approximately 30,000 uh, per year in the U.S. alone, making it the second most lethal cancer behind cancer of the lung and bronchus. So understanding why prostate cancer is so lethal and figuring out, determining ways to effectively uh, eliminate that lethality, more effectively treat it, is really our objective. So prostate cancer has three, what I would say, quite remarkable features, and Dan Lin touched on this a little bit. The first is that there are a large number of prostate cancers that behave very indolently, um, and it's this phase of malignancy that we really don't see in any other cancer with the exception of one type of a lymphoma. So there are a subset of these tumors, arguably, that you can simply watch that will never do harm, and we don't do that in breast, colon, lung, et cetera. But the two aspects that I'll focus on really is this striking bone-dominant pattern of metastases. When prostate cancer leaves its site of origin, it has this predilection to go to the bone, and I'll describe that in some detail. And then this remarkable dependence or sensitivity to androgens that, again, isn't found in any other cancer uh, that we deal with. <clears throat> So uh, Dan Lin touched on this a, a bit. So here's a, a human body. This is where the prostate is located. If you take it out surgically and simply do a cross-section of it, um, this is what it looks like with the urethra here in the middle. And then we're blowing up histologically. So when the pathologist looks at it under the microscope, we're looking at this middle section here. And circled are where the cancers are. Now, interestingly, prostate cancer is often multifocal. When you look across the entire gland, you see different sites that seem to have occurred at roughly the same time, but what we're starting to realize is that these cancers are molecularly distinct, uh, and I'll touch on that a little bit uh, more as we go through. And this is um, a blow-up view of one of these areas, simply showing you the complexity that the cancer is comprised certainly of the tumor cells, but there are many benign cells as well that we are also starting to realize influence how that cancer behaves. So we're recognizing that cancer is very heterotypic. You have your tumor cells, but you also have benign cells that aren't tumorigenic but are very important, such as this blood vessel here. So when cancer cells get into this blood vessel, invade into it, it gives them a ready conduit to travel throughout the rest of the body uh, in the context of a metastasis. Same for lymphatics. <clears throat> so primary tumors, if they stay put, are rarely lethal, uh, no matter what organ they're growing in, with the exception of the brain. Um, but tumor cells become lethal when they invade into the surrounding tissues and spread to other organs. So when prostate cancer spreads, for example, to the bone, we still call it prostate cancer. We don't call it bone cancer. It's where that site of origin was that dictates the nomenclature uh, then on. So this process of spread is called metastases. And metastases basically means meta is a change, and stasis is a state, so it's a change of state. And it's the process where a tumor cell invades and leaves its original site. It transports to another organ, and importantly, in that organ, it can then divide and grow out of control and cause a lot of damage. So the metastases are basically secondary tumors that are disjointed spatially from that original tumor. Now, luckily, this process is very inefficient. Uh, so it's been estimated that a tumor about one centimeter in diameter sheds more than two and a half million tumor cells into the bloodstream every day, but only a very tiny percentage of those, again, luckily, will actually carry out that full metastatic process. The majority of these tumor cells, once they get into the bloodstream, will be killed by the immune system or be destroyed by the forces uh, of that when that tumor cell travels in the bloodstream or when it gets to that different site, it just won't be able to set up shop and grow and proliferate. So we call this the metastatic cascade. You can think of it as a decathlon because these tumor cells have to go through so many steps. Just briefly, here's your tumor that's distant from the blood vessel. That tumor cell has to break its normal boundaries and bonds, spread into the connective tissue, get into the bloodstream here, travel through that entire blood vessel to get to the distant site. It then has to stop or arrest and then transit again through the blood vessel into that other site 
where then it starts to grow. So this process is extraordinarily difficult to accomplish, yet tumor cells certainly are capable of doing that. A striking feature of metastases is that for many tumors, it's organ site specific. So these tumor cells have a tropism uh, or a likelihood of going to one specific place. So a number of cancers do this. In the case of prostate cancer, bone is the preferred site. Um, and this concept was recognized a uh, hundred years ago in the late 1800s. Stephen P Paget um, uh, put forth this hypothesis of a seed in a soil. The seed being the tumor can only grow if the adequate soil is there um, to nurture it and, in and enrich its survival. <clears throat> um, so it's very clear that certain organs are better sites for metastases uh, than others. So here's an example of a pelvis, a pelvic bone. Here's the spine coming down. Here are your femurs on either side, the upper leg bones. And this is actually a woman with metastatic breast cancer. Breast cancer goes to the bone, but it sets up a very classic response in the bone that is usually osteolytic. That means it destroys the bone. And these lucencies here, these kind of areas that are more clear, are basically bone that's being destroyed uh, and removed, so you have these uh, open areas. In contrast, prostate cancer, which again spreads to the bone, often does just the opposite, and we call these osteoblastic lesions. And these are these very dark areas that you can see in the uh, lower lumbar vertebra and in the iliac crest here. So these very dense areas are stimulated by the prostate tumor cells that are there in the bone, causing new bone growth. The problem is that bone isn't stable. It's actually very weak bone, but it can cause a lot of symptoms, such as bone pain. Here is a, a histology of prostate cancer in the bone. So all of these uh, dark bluish purple cells here are tumor cells in the environment that should contain your normal blood precursor cells, which is where uh, the bone marrow is, is where your uh, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets are made. So having a prostate cancer in that area excludes the normal bone marrow, which leads to consequences that prostate cancer patients have of low uh, blood counts. Now another problem with prostate cancer is that it usually spreads to multiple sites simultaneously. So initially, someone may have some pain or discomfort you do an imaging study and you can see a location here, so you initially see one site, but all you uh, have to do is wait a little while and other sites will start to show up. <clears throat> so these very small sites, which are originally invisible to your imaging, uh, means that these tumor cells had gone there uh, but hadn't grown at the same rate of your initial tumor, but over time it will start to emerge and grow. What this tells you is that going after an individual tumor will not be effective, that you really need some type of systemic uh, treatment. So the prostate cancer patients that we see with more advanced disease can present in one of two ways. One is their very first presentation. Uh, they walk in the door because they're having bone pain, for example. So their first inkling that they ever had prostate cancer is when it's already spread. Secondarily, it may be a patient that was treated with surgery or treated with radiation, and then months or years later, uh, they're found to have tumor spread, meaning at the time they were diagnosed and treated, those tumor cells had already spread microscopically. Either way, in this situation, we need systemic treatment. So this advanced metastatic prostate cancer is currently not curable, but it is highly treatable, and we'll get into those details. There's this striking metastatic pattern to bone, usually multifocal. These bone lesions can be painful, and they can cause fractures or breaks in the bone. Um, once prostate cancer spreads, many patients also lose their appetite and lose a lot of weight, so this, con this term is called cachexia. And then, as I mentioned, it affects where the uh, blood cells are produced in the bone marrow, so these patients can also become anemic, again, emphasizing the need for systemic treatment. So what is this systemic treatment? So a remarkable discovery in the late 1950s and early 1960s by a urologist, Dr. Lynn's hero, in the field, identified the fact that prostate cancers are extraordinarily sensitive to testosterone. 
He actually made other, other observations that breast cancers, a subtype, were sensitive to estrogens, but his major uh, finding in the field related to prostate cancer because he started treating men that had spread of the prostate cancer into the bone by simply removing testosterone. And these patients had dramatic responses. And this is an excerpt from his Nobel Prize winning uh, 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 speech that he gave in 1966. And it's hard to put this in better words. He basically is saying in these hormone responsive cancers such as prostate cancer, endocrine modification, i.e. suppressing testosterone, can have catastrophic effects on the cancer cells themselves. Um, in several kinds of tumors in men and in animals, even in the very late terminal stages of the disease. And he says these results are often spectacular. The benefit can be evident within a few hours after the intervention. This is still the mainstay of treatment for advanced prostate cancer today, 50 years later after uh, his really seminal discoveries. <clears throat> So here's a brief history of testosterone as it relates to prostate cancer. Actually, in the late 1700s, it was noticed that there was a relationship between castration, i.e. suppressing blood levels of testosterone, and the size of the prostate gland. In the mid-1800s, uh, Berthold did some interesting experiments with roosters uh, and demonstrated that the testicles acted on the blood and the blood then acted on the whole organism. So this is really the father of endocrinology, of the activity of hormones that foretold how insulin worked, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, an interesting character in the medical field, a man named Brown Sicard in late 1800s, did some uh, rather odd and interesting experiments of taking what he called a rejuvenating elixir. And these were extracts of dog and guinea pig testicles that he self-injected kind of as a fountain of youth. Um, and so men still think this way, uh, that this uh, <laughs> might be a rejuvenating uh, elixir. And we can discuss that in the discussion section if you like. But his experiments were actually shown most likely to be due to a placebo effect. Um, <laughs> testosterone was synthesized in the mid-1930s. Uh, uh, and then, as I mentioned, Charles Huggins won the Nobel Prize for the identification of suppressing testosterone in the prostate effect. Um, importantly, in the 1980s, a chemical means of suppressing testosterone was developed, and these are these LHRH agonists, and I'll describe that in some detail. Um, and then in the 2010s, just most recently, some very new uh, important advances in further hitting and suppressing the androgen axis within tumor cells have continued to show survival, advances in uh, survival benefit, and I'll touch on those as well. So this is really what we're talking about, the androgen receptor, abbreviated here AR, and testosterone, and I'll just call this the engine and the fuel. So the androgen receptor is the engine driving prostate cancer, and the fuel is testosterone. So if you look at this panel uh, here on your far left, um, these are depictions of tumors, prostate tumor cells. Here's a prostate tumor cell with the androgen receptor, uh, which testosterone binds to and basically turns on. The testosterone is coming from the testicles primarily, so an endocrine effect. And what happens when testosterone enters a prostate uh, cancer cell and turns on the androgen receptor, a subset of the genes in that uh, cell are activated. And these genes tell a tumor cell to survive and also tell that tumor cell to proliferate or grow. And I just make the analogy that the testicles act as the gas pump. The blood vessels are the fuel line taking that testosterone into the engine, and that engine is the androgen receptor, which then turns on, and the genes or the genome would be the transmission getting that car to go. So it's a very simple way to think about the role of the androgen receptor uh, and testosterone. And this is what happens in, a, in an actual tumor cell. The androgen receptor, the engine, is labeled in green. And so most of the time, it's sitting in the cytoplasm of that cell. The center here that looks dark is the nucleus. When you add an androgen, like testosterone, in this case, the androgen is called DHT, it binds to that androgen receptor and moves it into the nucleus, where then it interacts with DNA. And certain segments of that DNA encode the genes. 
that when turned on, tell that cell to grow and divide. If you remove the androgen, that receptor goes back out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm of the cell, and that can keep going around in a, in a reaction like that. <clears throat> so to get into, this is a mini medical school. I'm gonna give you a little bit more detail about this process, but not too much. We won't have a detailed quiz about it later. Here's the bloodstream, here's the cell. The testosterone enters the cell. We won't get into too much detail here, but there's an enzyme that converts testosterone into an even more potent androgen called DHT. It's about 10 times as powerful as testosterone. That binds to the engine, the androgen receptor, which dimerizes, so two of these receptors come together, translocates then into the nucleus of this prostate cell where it recognizes specific DNA sequences, sits down, binds to that, and turns on genes. One of those genes is PSA that you heard about. That, gene, that protein that is used as the diagnostic marker for prostate cancer is directly turned on by testosterone and the androgen receptor, as well as another, a number of other genes involving uh, cell growth. <clears throat> so what happens in a more complex way with, throughout the whole body is this uh, hypothalam hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. So it turns out there's a hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone that's released by the hypothalamus. It interacts with the pituitary gland in the brain to cause another hormone called LH, which travels down to the testicles and tells the testicles to turn on testosterone. That testosterone then does a lot of things throughout the body, including interact with the prostate. So what do we do now therapeutically? Well, the old way, the way that Dr. Huggins, the urologist originally did it, was surgically remove the testicles. You then get rid of testosterone. I mentioned that there's this class of drugs that are called LHRH agonists. These can be given by an injection. And basically, they overdrive this system to eliminate this LH signal so the testicles don't see LH anymore, so they stop producing testosterone. It's a very potent way of suppressing testosterone that's reversible, unlike the uh, surgical approach. So this is what happens to a man with metastatic prostate cancer. This is called a bone scan, and these dark areas are prostate cancer in the bone. Yes, they're showing up. Uh, and with then one of these drugs that suppresses testosterone, you can see over time that basically these metastatic prostate cancers disappear. So it's very effective treatment uh, symptomatically as well. Bone pain can, uh, can be uh, resolved. So the natural history of this process is um, that 90% of the time, by suppressing testosterone, these metastases will shrink and patients will improve. The problem is it's not curative. Essentially, every patient over time, their prostate cancer will recur. And this is generally what happens within about 18 to 24 months after getting an initial good response, that tumor will come back. First by PSA levels going up as a marker of reactivation of androgen receptor, and then symptoms recur and tumor regrow. And this state has been variously termed androgen independent or hormone refractory, but the best current term is simply resistant to castration. So the blood levels are undetectable of testosterone, yet now the PSA is coming back on, the tumors are regrowing. Once PSA starts to come back on, the time to develop symptoms again of pain, for example, is about six months, and traditionally the time before symptoms develop to a patient dying of their cancer is six to 12 months after that. So this is basically what happens. Here we have a tumor, a prostate cancer that's initially androgen-dependent, an androgen-dependent prostate cancer. You ablate or eliminate androgens. The vast majority of these tumor cells will die, but there's a small subset here that are resistant, and then over time, they regrow and now become the dominant tumor called a castration-resistant prostate cancer. The striking and very important feature about this tumor is that PSA is turned on again, and all of the genes regulated by this androgen receptor are also turned back on. And that's a very striking finding. So the blood levels are undetectable, yet the program regulated by the receptor is turned back on. 
And for a, more than a decade, the field has been wrestling with how does this tumor reactivate the receptor in the absence of having testosterone? So some studies that were done here at the University of Washington took a step back and said, let's just answer or ask a very simple question, that is, is there any androgen or testosterone left in these tumors? Even though the blood level is undetectable, um, what is the level within a tumor? So from uh, men, uh, the group here looked within tumors resected from metastatic sites and developed an assay to very sensitively measure androgens. So this is the take home message here. The, the blood level is basically the level far here to the left, but the level in a tumor is much, much higher. So it told us that the levels in a tumor were actually capable of driving that androgen receptor activity. So the next question is, where do these androgens come from? Where does the testosterone or the DHT come from since the blood levels are basically undetectable? So <clears throat> this is the very complex pathway for how testosterone is synthesized. It starts from cholesterol, and there's a series of enzymes that are active in the testicle and the adrenal gland to synthesize testosterone from the cholesterol building block. So if you look back in these tumors from these men, turned out that their tumors expressed or turned on every one of the enzymes required to synthesize testosterone from cholesterol. So you have an ability of a tumor cell to actually make its own fuel. So this is the current thinking now, is that instead of a very rare tumor cell being resistant to suppressing the blood level of testosterone, there's an adaptive response where these tumors can start to reactivate the machinery to make its own fuel. Now why is that important? It's important because now you have many new drug targets to go after. And it turns out there's a drug that was developed just over the last few years called abiraterone that can block very effectively one of these enzymes. And there are several other drugs that I won't go into, but we can touch on later if you like, that also have the ability to block that androgen receptor. So just uh, in 2010, the report of using this new drug that blocks the synthesis of testosterone uh, through one of these enzymes, this drug called abiraterone, was shown to make men live longer. It extended survival substantially uh, compared to patients getting a placebo, even after they had failed chemotherapy. So this has now become one of the standards of care uh, in the field. <clears throat> so I'm gonna to touch just briefly on chemotherapy. Um, chemotherapy is still widely used for many malignancies, including prostate cancer. And this is the major drug that's used. It's called docetaxel. Um, it basically functions by inhibiting a component of a cell, it's in benign cells and tumor cells, called microtubules. These microtubules in, the, in this um, image here are in green, and it's basically a network throughout the cell that is very important when cells divide. It helps to basically pull them apart. And so what happens with this class of drugs, docetaxel or paclitaxel, these microtubules are irreversibly bound together. They can't dissociate from each other, and that induces a cell to undergo cell death. So <clears throat> this docetaxel was shown to make patients with prostate cancer live longer. Here was a very important study published um, in 2006 that basically showed if a man had metastatic prostate cancer, and they received this chemotherapy drug, they would live on average two months longer. So that was the state of the field for many years um, <clears throat> by showing at least some improvement in survival. But that's only part of that story because the question is, does it make every man simply live another two months? Or are there a subset of patients that actually do very, very well and a subset of patients that don't respond at all. And that's gonna be uh, the topic that I'm gonna end the talk with uh, in a moment, is being able to stratify or predict those patients more likely to benefit and have much longer survival than two months versus those patients that, uh, that won't. 
So reviewing the therapeutics for prostate cancer, in the 1960s, this concept of suppressing testosterone for patients with spread of prostate cancer to the bone extended survival by, on average, three years. I call 1960 to 2006 basically the dark ages. There were literally uh, 100 trials of different chemotherapeutic drugs that never showed any benefit in terms of making men live longer until this drug docetaxel, which extended life for about two months on average. Um, but the question is, are there some that do much better and some patients that don't respond at all? And then just over the last two years, we've had three new drugs approved because each of them significantly and substantially prolonged survival. A drug called cabazitaxel, which is a, um, a sister to docetaxel, a bit more potent, extends survival another two months after docetaxel is no longer effective. Provenge, an immunotherapy drug that I'll touch on in a moment, was shown to prolong survival on average again by four months. And this uh, androgen uh, pathway drug, abiraterone, also on average prolonged survival by four months. But we've had many patients live more than two to three years now on abiraterone. So trying to understand and predict who will best respond to what therapy is critical. <clears throat> There is a rich pipeline of new agents coming through that are being evaluated. And there are many, many questions. What sequence, what drug combinations are going to be most effective that are critical uh, as we move forward? So this concept of immunotherapy is very, very attractive. I think you had a previous uh, mini med school lecture about vaccine uh, type approaches in breast cancer and other tumor types. I'm um, only touch on one here, uh, one type of immunotherapy that's been shown to be very effective in prostate cancer that I mentioned just a moment ago, Provenge or Cell T. And basically, this is a different kind of immunotherapy where um, uh, cells from the immune system, so-called antigen-presenting cells or dendritic cells, are removed from a patient with prostate cancer and out of their body in the laboratory they're exposed to a prostate cancer protein called PAP. It revs up these immune cells uh, so that they present or show the immune system this prostate cancer protein. So those cells are reinfused back into the patient three times. And the intent is then the immune system will home in and go to wherever that protein is made by the prostate cancer cells. So this type of therapy again, was shown to prolong survival in patients with advanced prostate cancer. And here are their survival curves. On average, those patients that received this immunotherapy lived, again, on average, four additional months compared to those patients that did not. Again, there are some patients that didn't respond at all and others that did much, much better than four months. <clears throat> so how can we try to predict this? What can we use to... Uh, stratify patients so they're getting the therapies that they would be more likely to respond to versus um, <clears throat> those that they wouldn't. It gets into this idea of really understanding molecularly what's happening within a tumor. We call these molecular profiles or fingerprints, and they're really windows into cancer behavior and targeting um, particular vulnerabilities. So the concept here is the phenotype, that is the behavior of a tumor cell, and the potential for that cell to either become malignant or invade into the surrounding tissues or respond or resist to a particular therapy is really allowed or dictated or driven by the subset of genes in the genome that are turned on or activated at any point in time. And we call that being expressed by that cell. <clears throat> so a remarkable finding in prostate cancer gave us some insights as to what might be driving this uh, very malignant biology and behavior. And this was a finding that had previously only really been recognized in leukemias and lymphomas, the liquid type of tumors that we deal with. And that is a genetic rearrangement where two very different genes in different parts of the genome are fused or rearranged within a tumor cell. And this particular study found one of these rearrangements in prostate cancer. And I'm just gonna briefly walk you through this. 
So here is a gene, region, on chromosome 21. And this particular region on chromosome 21 has a gene called TEMPRS2 or TMPRSS2 that is turned on by androgen. So here's the androgen receptor, here's one of these response elements, and when androgen is around, this is now made or produced. So here's the receptor, you get a lot of this particular gene or protein made. Far away on this chromosome is an oncogene called ERG that's normally not turned on in a prostate cell. Turns out in a prostate cancer cell, this rearranges so the genetic information in between these two genes is deleted and removed and now you've hooked up a cancer gene with an androgen regulated gene. So now this cancer gene is turned on when you have testosterone. So it was kind of a smoking gun for how prostate cancer may develop by testosterone turning on this particular oncogene. So what we want to do is determine do these molecular changes provide some type of a fingerprint or a profile to indicate whether a given prostate cancer will behave well or be a bad guy and determine what it might be sensitive to. And this leads us into this concept of a personalized or precision medicine. It's very obvious, it's intuitive, logical, and deceptively simple. Putting it into practice is a bit more challenging. But that is to identify this molecular foundation or vulnerability and match the right treatment to the right tumor and avoid a one-size-fits-all. So what we want to do is um, avoid over-treating certain patients and eliminating side effects and avoid under-treating uh, others and certainly avoid wrongly treating. <clears throat> so I mentioned this molecular feature. It turns out in prostate cancer, we know there's at least 20 different molecular rearrangements that occur at various frequencies. Type 1 is the one I just showed you, this temporis 2 erg rearrangement. So by analyzing a tumor, we can start to identify these molecular drivers and engines. The question is, are there now 20 distinct vulnerabilities for these tumors that we would want to match drug A to vulnerability 1, drug B to vulnerability 2? So the National Academy of Sciences has now put out a new concept for how we would classify diseases that's based on molecular biology. It's a molecular taxonomy that goes beyond simply describing a tumor, in other words, what it looks like, but really get it its foundation and, and molecular engine. <clears throat> and the concept here is a typical cancer patient of the future would have a tumor biopsy and a full molecular analysis of that tumor and include now in a typical tumor board where you're trying to decide the appropriate treatment for that patient, you now bring in the genetic makeup of that tumor to more personalize and target the given treatment. So it's going to lead to an entirely new way of thinking about medicine that's very important for future medical students such as all of you in this mini medical school. Um, and that is, what's the training platform going to be for a new oncologist or a urologist or a radiation oncologist in this precision medicine era? How are we going to assess the exposures of patients with their inherent genomic alterations and track this to more personalize and target that therapy? So to end here, the prediction or the hope is that within five years, this medic, mini medical school that we're talking about, the mini medical school of tomorrow, will really look radically different uh, than what you've just heard. It will be much more precise in terms of uh, orienting treatments uh, and approaches. So I'll end there.